as I used to say on television. I'm Steve Allen. <laughs> if you don't know that, it's not going to be a big deal anyway. You know, millions of people are willing to spend money to be entertained. You uh, spend a few dollars on a record, a theater, concert ticket, and Michael Jackson becomes a millionaire. I think that's a nice arrangement for you as well as for Michael Jackson, and for me too. Of course, you also have some special talents, or whatever the job, if you do it well, you make life better for yourself, your family, and your neighbors. With a free market, our income is dependent on how much training we might have had, how well we do our job, and the scarcity of what we have to offer. Lucky for me, there weren't too many other Steve Allens around. But equal opportunity, that's the American dream. And that's a market economy, as Milton Friedman explained earlier in the series. Over the years, I've asked Milton for advice and understanding a number of aspects of economics and politics. He's a great teacher and, of course, a defender of freedom and individual rights. On the other hand, there are people who think Michael Jackson and others who earn astronomical incomes should be prevented from doing so. They think it would be better off if income, wealth, were shared, more or less evenly. Now, as a bare abstract idea, there is something appealing about that. Michael obviously doesn't need to earn 50 or 100 million a year, and there are certainly those who have practically no money at all. So, as I say, there have been philosophers over the centuries who have tried to diminish poverty by limiting the income at the top end of the scale. But the problem with that admittedly charming idea is that it has never worked. The Pilgrims tried a form of socialism over 300 years ago. Unfortunately for their fair-minded plans, they prospered only after they were allowed to keep for themselves all the food they grew and to uh, use it or sell it as they saw fit. Now to turn back the clock to the early days of the communist revolution in Russia, the basic aim, again, was to share the wealth. But uh, again, it didn't work. It had to be enforced with harsh laws, machine guns, and barbed wire. And in terms of pure economics, it was a failure. The end result was near poverty for all. So what humankind has been so long struggling to achieve is a fair system that will permit those with special gifts or abilities to accumulate a good deal of money without, at the same time, turning a blind eye to the sufferings of the poor. Now, no system can work if there isn't an accumulation of wealth. It just happens that the free market system is better in that regard than the alternatives. And in the ongoing debate on this issue, it's by no means necessary to argue that the free market system is perfect. It isn't. It's simply better than the other alternatives because it's the system that provides us many more choices, certainly much more freedom, and continued prosperity. Human and political freedom has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Freedom is making choices. What's best for me? What do I want to do? We all want to be free to choose. No government official is telling these people what to do. Parental control. Parents choosing the teacher. Parents monitoring the schooling. Free to live your own life, pursue your own goals, chase your own rainbow. Without the government breathing down on your neck or standing on your shoes. Most of us would choose prosperity if we could. But what's the best road to that goal? Free trade set off a process that revolutionized Japan and the lives of its people. The Pilgrims tried a form of socialism over 300 years ago. Unfortunately for their fair-minded plans, they prospered only after they were allowed to keep for themselves all the food they grew. Who says economic institutions don't matter? We may dream of a perfect world, but we all know that's not possible. Hong Kong is very far from utopia. Life is unfair. There's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. I do not know any exception to the proposition that if you compare like with like, the freer the system, the better off the ordinary poor people have been. Dr. Friedman has spent a lifetime studying freedom and prosperity. To him, the lessons of history are clear. People are better off making their own choices, better off not relying on government. Free to choose is a survival kit for you and for liberty.
From Victorian novelists to modern reformers, a favorite device to stir our emotions is to contrast extremes of wealth and of poverty. We are expected to conclude that the rich are responsible for the deprivations of the poor. That they are rich at the expense of the poor. Whether it is in the slums of New Delhi or in the affluence of Las Vegas, it simply isn't fair that there should be any losers. Life is unfair. There's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. There's nothing fair about one man being born of a wealthy parent and one of an impecunious parent. There's nothing fair about Muhammad Ali having been born with a skill that enables him to make millions of dollars one night. There's nothing fair about Marlena Dietrich having great legs that we all want to watch. There's nothing fair about any of that. But on the other hand, don't you think a lot of people who like to look at Marlena Dietrich's legs benefited from nature's unfairness in producing a Marlena Dietrich? What kind of a world would it be if everybody was an absolute identical duplicate of anybody else. You might as well destroy the whole world and just keep one specimen left for a museum. This beautiful estate, its manicured lawns, its trees, its shrubs, was built by men and women who were taken by force in Africa and sold as slaves in America. These kitchen gardens were planted and tended by them to furnish food for themselves and their master, Thomas Jefferson, the squire of Monticello. It was Jefferson who wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words, penned by Thomas Jefferson at the age of 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, have served to define a basic ideal of the United States throughout its history. Much of our history has revolved about the definition and redefinition of the concept of equality, about the attempt to translate it into practice. What did Thomas Jefferson mean by the words, all men are created equal? He surely did not mean that they were equal and or identical in what they could do or in what they believed. After all, he was himself a most remarkable person. At the age of 26, he designed this beautiful house at Monticello, supervised its construction, and indeed is said to have worked on it with his own hands. He was an inventor, a scholar, an author, a statesman, governor of Virginia, president of the United States, minister to France. He helped shape and create the United States. What he meant by the words equal can be seen in the phrase endowed by their creator. To Thomas Jefferson, all men are equal in the eyes of God. They all must be treated as individuals who have each separately a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, practice did not conform to the ideals in Jefferson's life or in ours as a nation. He agonized repeatedly during his lifetime about the con conflict between the institution of slavery and the fine words of the Declaration. Yet, during his whole life, he was a slave owner. This is the city palace in Jaipur, the capital of the Indian state of Rajasthan. It's just one of the elegant houses that were built here 150 years ago by the prince who ruled this land. There are no more princes, no more Maharajas in India today. 
All titles were swept away by the government of India in its quest for equality. But as you can see, there are still some people here who live a very privileged life. The descendants of the Maharaja finance this kind of life partly by using other palaces as hotels for tourists. Tourists who come to India to see how the other half lives. This side of India, the exotic glamorous side, is still very real. Everywhere in the world there are gross inequalities of income and wealth. They offend most of us. A myth has grown up that free market capitalism increases such inequalities, that the rich benefit at the expense of the poor. Nothing could be further from the truth. Wherever the free market has been permitted to operate, the ordinary man has been able to attain levels of living never dreamed of before. Nowhere is the gap between rich and poor. Nowhere are the rich richer and the poor poorer than in those societies that do not permit the free market to operate, whether they be feudal societies where status determines position or modern centrally planned economies where access to government determines position. Central planning was introduced in India in considerable part in the name of equality. The tragedy is that after 30 years, it is hard to see any significant improvement in the lot of the ordinary person. The Yehudi Menuhin School in the south of England is also a place of privilege. Musically talented children from all over the world compete for a chance to come here to study. Much of the moral fervor behind the drive for equality comes from the widespread belief that it is not fair that some children should have a great advantage over others simply because they happen to have wealthy parents. Of course it's not fair. But is there any distinction between the inheritance of property and the inheritance of what at first sight looks very different? These youngsters have inherited wealth, not in the form of bonds or stocks, but in the form of talent. That 15-year-old is an accomplished cellist. His father is a distinguished violinist. It's no accident that most of the children at this school come from musical families. The inheritance of talents is no different from an ethical point of view from the inheritance of other forms of property, of bonds, of stocks, of houses, or of factories. Yet many people resent the one, but not the other. Or look at the same issues from the point of view of the parent. If you want to give your child a special chance, there are different ways you can do it. You can buy him an education, an education that will give him skills enabling him to earn a higher income. Or you can buy him a business. Or you can leave him property, the income from which will enable him to live better. Is there any ethical difference between these three ways of using your property? Or again, if the state leaves you any money to spend over and above taxes, should you be permitted to spend it on riotous living, but not permitted to leave it to your children? The ethical issues involved are subtle and complex. They are not to be resolved by resort to such simplistic formulas 
as fair shares for all. Indeed, if you took that seriously, it's the youngsters with less musical skill, not those with more, who should be sent to this school in order to compensate for their inherited disadvantage. When the evening started, all of these players had about the same number of chips in front of them. But as the play progressed, they surely didn't. Some won, some lost. By the end of the evening, some of them will have big pile of chips, others will have small ones. They'll be big winners, they'll be big losers. In the name of equality, should the winnings be redistributed to the losers so that everybody ends up where he started? That would take all the fun out of the game. Even the losers wouldn't like that. They might like it tonight. But would they come back again to play if they knew that whatever happened, they'd end up exactly where they had started? We're only one minute away from double jackpot time. When we're in the double jackpot time, watch the double jackpot board. With the number of your spots, and you're going to be the one double jackpot. Now, if you like your favorite machine, you check this game, and you listen to the horn after the countdown. When you hear the horn... But what does Las Vegas have to do with the real world? A great deal more than you might think. It's one very important part of our life in highly concentrated form. Every day, all of us are making decisions that involve gambles. Sometimes they're big gambles, as when we decide what occupation to pursue or whom to marry. More often, they're small gambles, as when we decide whether to cross the street against the traffic. But each time, the question is, who shall make the decision, we or somebody else? We can make the decision only if we bear the consequences. That's the economic system that has transformed our society in the past century and more. That's what gave the Henry Fords, the Thomas Alva Edisons, the Christian Barnards, the incentives to produce the miracles that have benefited us all. It's what gave other people the incentive to provide them with the finance for their ventures. Of course, there were lots of losers along the way. We don't remember their names, but remember, they went in with their eyes open. They knew what they were doing. And win or lose, we society benefited from their willingness to take a chance. Lance Van Orman has an idea. He's taking a chance. Who knows, I suppose it's possible that we might all benefit from it one day. But that isn't why he's taking a chance. He's doing it just because he wants to get rich. This is his business headquarters in Las Vegas. Empty, except for the idea that he shares with his partner, who will handle the production end of the venture when things really get going. Well, the idea is that if you have an oil spill in the ocean or in the river, you want to try and get it under control. And what I'm going to simulate here is put some of this oil down. There's your oil spill of major proportions. I'll 
with this product, what I can do is, unfortunately, what I can't show you here is that if you put this product down with a application system, you wring the oil spill in such a manner. Now, the application system will make it much finer and it'll control this. I don't know if you can see what's happening to the oil yet, but it's just literally being drawn into this stuff. Now, as I spray it across the top, now it's starting to draw it in. Now, I've got way more than I need. This controls like 10 times its weight in oil. And it will not sink. It's been chemically treated. It's cellulose. It's been chemically treated so that it will in fact, not do anything with the water. It hates water, but it loves oil. And I don't know if you can see, we have containment devices, and that's what we're going to use this with. Now, you can see that it's just taken a very little amount of this oil absorbing product, which we call oil eater, to pick this up. Now, the nice thing about it is that after that oil spill there, we have the system to do what I'm doing with my hand, and that's pick all this up. And there's the oil out of the product. Now, if you want the oil back, that's not a big problem, if I can keep it all under control. The oil will come out, and there we go, allowing it. I don't know if you can see. There we go. Now, what I've done is I quit my regular job. And I mortgaged everything I've got. And it's quite, quite a risk to do this, but the product works. You can see it works. You know, people talk to me and they'll say, yeah, but you're crazy. You don't have a job. You don't know where the next paycheck's going to come from. As a matter of fact, I think maybe I've got $10 in my pocket right now. But I don't worry about it because I get up in the morning and it's, it's my world. I, I own it. I can sit back and say I'm losing, or I can sit back and say I'm winning. And I can go out and change the odds in my favor. People who are free make their own choices. These two men do a dangerous, noisy, filthy job. They don't do it because they like it. They do it because it's well paid. That's their choice. This young man has given up any thought of a steady, well-paid career in order to take a job on a golf course. He wants to become a professional golfer. It's a big gamble, but it's one that he has decided to take. When people are free, they are able to use their own resources most effectively and you have a great deal of productivity, a great deal of opportunity. The major beneficiaries are always a small man. The man who has power, who's at the top of a society, he's going to do well whatever kind of a society you have. It's the society which gives the small man the opportunity to go his way, which is going to benefit him the most. And that is why, if you ask, where in the world do ordinary people have the greatest opportunity for themselves and their children? It's not in Russia. It's not, on the other hand, in India. It's in places like the United States, like Hong Kong, like Britain, as it was. Not so clearly Britain as it is. For much of this century, the British have tried to use a law to impose equality with very indifferent results. The failure of the drive for equality is not because the wrong measures were adopted, not because they were badly administered, not because the wrong people administered it. The failure is much more fundamental. It is because that drive goes against the most basic instinct of all human beings. In the words of Adam Smith, the uniform, constant, and uninterrupted effort of every man to better his condition, to improve his own lot, and to make a better world for his children and his children's children. There is no moral code that justifies laws fixing prices or fixing wages. 
or preventing a man from earning a living unless he joins a union and submits himself to the discipline of the union, or forcing you to buy more expensive goods at home when cheaper goods are available from abroad. Everywhere and at all times, economic progress has meant far more to the poor than to the rich. Wherever progress has been achieved, it has relieved the poor from back-breaking toil. It has also enabled them to enjoy the comforts and conveniences that have always been available to the rich. During the 19th century, and especially after the Civil War and on into the 20th century, the idea of equality came to have a much more definite and specific meaning than the abstract concept of equality before God. It came more and more to mean that everyone should have the same opportunity to make what he could of his capacities. That all careers should be open to people on the basis of their talents, independently of the race or religion or belief or social class that characterized them. This concept of equality of opportunity offers no conflict at all with the concept of freedom. On the, on the contrary, they reinforce one another, and it is no doubt the concept that even today is most widely held. But in the 20th century, beginning especially abroad, and at a later date in this country, a very different concept, a very different ideal has begun to emerge. That is the ideal that everyone should be equal in income, in level of living, in what he has. The idea that the economic race should be so arranged that everybody ends at the finish line at the same time, rather than that everyone starts at the beginning line at the same time. This concept raises a very serious problem for freedom. It is clearly in conflict with it, since it requires that the freedom of some be restricted in order to provide greater benefits to others. The society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. I'm Linda Chavez. I hope you've enjoyed Created Equal, the last in the Free to Choose series. Joining Dr. Friedman to discuss the concept of equality are Thomas Sowell of the Hoover Institution and Michael Kinsley of the New Republic. Tell me, Mr. Kinsley, is individual freedom all that matters, or should we be concerned about the unequal distribution of wealth? I think, of course, we should be concerned. Let me make two concessions, however, at the very beginning. Number one, capitalism is an economic system that benefits everybody, including those at the bottom, as Milton Friedman has so eloquently pointed out, capitalism requires incentives. Incentives necessarily imply some degree of inequality. Second of all, as, as was pointed out towards the end of, of, the, of, the, of the show, even apart from economics, radical leveling experiments have been disasters for human freedom, Pol Pot, Stalin, and so on. Having made those two concessions, I do not think you have therefore said that the government has no role in promoting e e equality. Much of the inequality we see around us cannot be explained as capitalism working its will in textbook circumstances. Some of it is just luck, the most boring example being inherited wealth. Some of it is the result of economic activity that is capitalist but is not really productive. I think even Milton Friedman would concede there, are, there is that category. Some aspects of investment banking, leap up as the obvious example from the 80s. Some is the result of government policy, for example, most. auctioning off valuable television licenses. Secondly, Meritocracy. Let's talk you about. You mean not auctioning off television yes. licenses? Not auctioning, of course, of course, uh, giving away television right, licenses. Right, right. Even when capitalism is working in the textbook way, increasing everybody's wealth, much of the qualities that are being rewarded there are essentially innate, and the term meritocracy really disguises that, disguises that, and implies that intelligence, talent, such as the students of the Hudi Manuin School are exactly the same as hard work and initiative. And it seems to me those are very different categories of, 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 of reward. So because of that, I think a certain amount of government-induced redistribution is not a bad idea. 
But is it really redistribution, or Dr. Sowell, is it putting people at the starting line, as Dr. Friedman said? Well, I, I'm still trying to see the connection between what he said before and what he said at the end. Uh, no, what the government is trying to do what is, is to set up programs justified on the assumption that they are equalizing. I think the crucial thing is that when you try to create this equality, you don't create the equality, you create something else. Uh, I've been doing studies now for 20 years of programs designed to increase equality. Uh, they increase inequality because even when the programs are designed for disadvantaged groups, they help the affluent members of disadvantaged groups while the lower members of those groups fall further behind than ever before. And not just in the United States, in India, to some extent in Malaysia, the very same thing is happening. But would you say that that is a theoretical necessity or is that because of these specific programs being badly designed? Mr. Friedman, Dr. Na Friedman. Name, name a well-designed one. Yes. Well, you designed one, the negative income tax. I did not design that in, in the sense in which you mean it. I, I have favored the negative income tax as a way of getting from where we are now to where I would ultimately like to be. It's a less bad alternative than our present mess. But it, it's not in and of itself a good alternative, no. But you wouldn't favor it, but it would not, it seems to me, suffer from the defect that uh, Professor Soule sees in, in the welfare programs we have today of large bureaucracies of inadvertent beneficiaries and so on and so forth. And it would, seems to me, be possible to redistribute wealth. But is it a good idea to redistribute wealth? It is possible to redistribute wealth. The question is whether in the process of redistributing wealth, you don't inevitably accompany it by side effects, which have the characteristic that they make things worse rather than better. Because what happens every time you go to redistribute wealth? You establish a, a, a pie there for somebody to grab. And there are lots of people around trying to grab them. And they are going to go down to Washington or to the State House or wherever it is and work and try to convert that program into one which, although it started out fine, almost all of these welfare programs that you and I now regard as having bad effects, started out fine. The new broom sweeps clean. I wouldn't necessarily concede that every welfare program we have now is, has entirely bad effects. It doesn't have an entirely bad effect. Or even primarily bad effects. Well, name one, which I'm on the whole... The, the Head Start program is a great success. Now, does that come under, uh, maybe that comes under your category of equality of opportunity rather than equality of result. But nevertheless, it is a major government program that is well, taking tax money and spending it on poor people. I think that if you're going to say the government should uh, do things of that sort to help people to help themselves to rise up and meet some standards, uh, whatever the theoretical objections might be to it, I think that the political objections are relatively minor, that very few people would argue against that. The polls that I've seen suggest that almost every segment of the society would support it. Now, whether well, then why is it? that even today, 20 years or 25 years after it started, Head Start is only available to a small fraction of the people who qualify Thank for it. Thank you. That's our whole point. Because that isn't the kind of program that can get political support. That isn't the kind of program that brings the fancy paid lobbyists down to Washington. But no, if you look at no, what government surely. spends, look at what government spends, and ask yourself how much of it can be characterized as being spent for purposes that you would regard as desirable. Oh, I think you're absolutely right that the government redistribution programs very often redistribute from the worse off to the better off or from the middle to the middle. Social Security, Medicare, the Farm Price Support Program is obviously an egregious example of that. But surely it is, it is conservatives and Republicans and people who consider themselves allied with Professor Sowell and Professor Friedman who prevented the expansion of the Head Start program. I doubted very much what I think prevented the expansion of the Head Start program was the ability of the people for these other programs getting in first. Let me illustrate very directly about the kind of people you represent. The worst program from the point of view of t taking money from the poor and giving it to the rich is none of those you mentioned. It's higher education mm -hmm. in the United States. There's no program in the United States that so clearly taxes the poor to benefit the people of the present rich and of the people who are going to be rich. I mean the student loan program. The st it's not no. only the students, it's, it's oh, state universities state in every, every state. Oh. It's total government spending on higher education, whether in the form of so-called loan programs, most of which are grant programs, ah. or in the form of straight now. Have you had any, which, which, let me ask you, which lobby has been more influential? The lobby in favor of, of expanding that program or the lobby in favor of expanding the, the Head Start program? Well, yeah, I'm going to dig myself into a hole here, but uh, how far do you push this logic? Do you put why higher education and not uh, 
secondary and primary. Oh, I agree on secondary. I'm in favor of, I, I think the same thing is true in secondary and primary, except that secondary and primary, from a redistributive point of view, is not as bad. Because everyone goes. That's Just right. Just about everyone it, goes. And, and it has a, it's compulsory. Uh, personally, I'm in favor of privatizing secondary and primary and ultimately getting rid of government subsidy, except, and here I would agree, and here I'm going to go to your side, that I would agree uh, that there remains a residual necessity of providing for the children whose parents are, for whatever reason, not in a position to finance their schooling. Well, let me, oh, go ahead. But, you know, I don't think it's accidental that the emphasis has been at the higher education level when it comes to money. Again, if you look at other countries, you see the same thing. When they say they're going to help the, the, the poor and the downtrodden in India, they do it by allowing preferential admission to medical schools. Well, these people out there in the villages who don't have uh, enough to eat are not going to go to any medical schools. That they always start at the top, that they want to give out the goodies that have the prestige and the visibility. Uh, they're not interested in raising the test scores, you know, uh, in some Harlem school. Well, surely, sh would you say that you would prefer it if society did not offer an opportunity for higher education to everyone, whether they could afford it or not? Or but would you prefer some other system of accomplishing that you've, goal? You've evaded the question. What's a society? What you really mean is, would I prefer it that government not offer it? That's right. And the answer is yes. Well, if government doesn't offer it, how can you be assured because that Because society happen? does. Look, long before the government was providing, federal government certainly, long before the federal government was providing subsidies. The state governments were providing subsidies. state government. Well, there's were. no difference in principle. But even long before that, the earliest uh, how colleges and universities in the United States were established not by state governments. Harvard, but, but, which you went to, was established by no, private that, people. That was not, that was not, an, an opportunity to go to Harvard is not universally available. Am I naive? My impression was that the GI Bill after World War II, correct me if I'm wrong, gave millions of people who otherwise would not have had the opportunity to go to higher education to go. It what did. I would say is, let's have a system where, I think the, there are abuse of the student loan program was clearly uh, re redistribution, but the basic principle that is, it is the role of government to make sure that everyone has the opportunity who can qualify for it and who can make use of it for an excellent higher education is a good one, and you mitigate the redistributive effects of that through the income tax system. The problem is to get stuck on objectives and not on outcomes. Of course that would be a desirable outcome. It is desirable that everybody have the opportunity. I'm not questioning that, provided he's willing to pay for it, either before or after. I do not think there's any justification whatsoever for people who do not go to college subsidizing people who do. Well, surely, surely, I mean, I think if you want to set up a system where you can the, you loan the money, you pay it back over the long run, I think that's fine. Surely a progressive income tax system roughly approximates precisely that system. The people who go to college have higher opportunity, they end up making more money, and under a progressive tax system they will therefore pay more money over the course of their lives to the government, which will be used to fund this system, among other things. You mean so a you, you, you mean sort a, of reinvented the wheel here, it You mean a me. graduated income tax system, because what's called a progressive income tax system is not progressive at all. If you look at the actual payment of taxes by the populace, it is not true, unfortunate, for, fortunately, I would say, that higher income classes pay a higher percentage right. of their income. You're, you're, you're with, I'm with you on that. You're arguing my side of the defense. No, 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 but each time you yeah, see, you, you, you look you, forward in hope. Yes, in other words, you, you keep telling me how these are wonderful ideas. It's just that they never work out in practice. It's like the Marxists who are telling us that uh, Eastern Europe wasn't really socialism. Nothing that ever existed on this earth is, was ever really socialism. Uh, it's only in, in their imagination. It's, at some point, you have to ask yourself, could it be that this principle cannot work out in practice with human beings as they exist on this planet? Let me say two things to that. Number one, I'm certainly not saying that it never works out in practice. I think that, the, for example, the University of California uh, higher education system is actually one of the one of the jewels of western civilization i've taught in that system uh and do it you is really not. wish it didn't exist yes well you mean it's a jewel uh, of the of western civilization that california which has the most extensive state system of schooling in the country should have a smaller fraction of youngsters of the age of 60 uh, of the appropriate age graduate from college than the average for the country i what is it? that's a fact why is it a fact because they're spending too much on Berkeley, is that? Is no, that no, because the, the kids who go to California universities and colleges drop out. Fifty percent of the people who enter as freshmen in UCLA 
drop out before they graduate. And why? Why? Because these, this is a state system in which uh, you have a, uh, entry is essentially widespread and free, and the result of it is the quality of the schooling that is given is very low. It's a place where people go to have a good time, not to have an education. It's a nice interlude between, uh, uh, between high school and, and the real world. And it, it's because, let me, let me ask you something. Do you really think that people appreciate something they don't pay for? I, I didn't pay for my higher education, and I certainly appreciate it. You're one of the rare people. Isn't it? You we certainly, all knew. You That's not my impression. My but impression. you will agree that in general. In, as a general principle of life, certainly. People, if they don't pay for it, if they get it for nothing, they value it at nothing. And I, what I, happens I, I is I, I, that insofar as there are any large number of people like that, any large number of kids who go to college just because it's an easy, cheap, free, pleasant thing to do, it destroys it for the Look, ones who would like to get something. Yes. Whenever you're giving away, whenever the government is giving away things instead of simply redistributing money, obviously there are inefficiencies. Anything that's free, like people use too much water if their water isn't metered, higher education no doubt suffers from the same, same fact. I want to get to something else that Tom Sowell said, this analogy to socialism which is one of the things that sticks in my craw. As I said at the beginning, obviously there are levels of redistribution that are nightmares. And are, I do not think you can analogize from socialism to the progressive income tax. No, no, tax. no, no, you missed the point entirely. I was saying that you're, that you're making the argument that they're making, which is this is a wonderful idea. It's just that when we come to specific examples of it, it always ends up in disaster. Well, I, and, and, and yet somehow it still remains a wonderful idea. You mentioned California. I taught there. There's another reason what, for the problems of, of the California system, and that is that the people who are in a position to appropriate the rents, as we say, do so, namely the faculty, that these are research factories. These are not teaching places. I can remember in faculty meetings, whenever I would mention uh, the students or the taxpayers, there'd be a knowing smile as this, oh, so has this uh, thing, you know, and they, they would tolerate it and go on because it, was, it is run for the professors. Uh, I was on but the faculty. The, but are you, is it your impression that private universities such as Harvard, Yale, and Princeton are not run for the professors to the same degree? Not to the same degree. They are run for the professors, again, because all of them are also getting government money. But, but surely it's example, not just that. It's because uh, oh, they're, it's, because it's because they're large also. bureaucratic institutions. No, no, but, but, even, but before the government money got there, you had much higher teaching loads. For example, at Columbia, when um, Bazin wrote this book about the teacher in the 1940s. He mentioned the teaching load at Columbia was 15 semester hours. Uh, the, the, a rural college out in the boondocks with no reputation at all would not have people teaching like that. As you poured more government money in, you got more and more people doing less and less teaching. If we can uh, get off the issue of universities and get back to the issue for a moment of income redistribution. A fact of life, a fact of history, the greatest period of eleemosynary activity in United States history was in the 19th century when government was very small. That's when the great bulk of the private colleges and universities were founded. Harvard was even earlier, of course. That's when you had the Red Cross, the Boy Scouts, you name one after another. Yes, but Milton, there were the level of services to the poor, the level of redistribution, if you want to call it that, that went on in the 19th century was obviously far lower than it is today. There was not health care for the poor universally or even approaching what we have today. There was not education for the poor that there is today. Now, if you want to say, if you, if you want to say that we, the government should not be involved in these forms of redistribution, I think you should have the courage of your convictions and say and recognize that the redistribution will not take place and not sort of hide behind the hope that private eleemosynary efforts I don't, will, I don't agree with your, will, your interpretation will, will, will of the facts. The great private, uh, private uh, non-profit hospitals were all founded in the 19th century. In many ways, the poor had better access, the very poor. The saying used to be when I was growing up, this was a long, long time ago before we had this great development back in the 1920s. The standard saying was the very poor can get good medicine. The very rich can get good medicine. The people in between are the ones who are squeezed. Look, our health care system is a mess, and for many reasons. It is a mess. Uh, uh, because it's not free market. But it's, uh, and I have to defer to your expertise, but I find it very hard to believe that the poor had better access to health care in the 19th century than they have today. Well, let me give you another example. The immigrants who came from Europe, my parents and, uh, and other people, uh, there were very active and effective eleemosynary institutions 
to help them out to enable them to get started. Is fairness not an issue at all? Should we just give up on this notion, Dr. So? Well, it depends what you mean by fairness. Uh, if you, you're talking about fairness as opportunity, certainly. But that's wholly different from the notion of redistributing. I, I'm appalled at the notion that there's some people out there who are permanently called the poor as if they're born with a scarlet P on their forehead. Uh, the great thing that's happened for the poor in this country is they stopped being poor. And, the, and they stopped being poor because you did not have the government control of the markets uh, that we're cl slowly uh, building up. And as you've now begun to add that, now we're talking about permanent underclasses. And again, the people who are saying these wonderful things don't ask, how did it work out? What happened? My point is, is a sort of much more elementary one than that. Where you end up in life's rat race is to a large degree a function of luck. Absolutely. It is not Absolutely. a function of, ta of, well, talent is luck. As you point out, inherited wealth, inherited talent, same thing. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is fate. And it seems to me that given that, if there is a way to mitigate fate somewhat with minimum damage to the economy, to, to, the, to the total production of, fact of the economy, that that is a very good thing to do. Agreed. And Agreed. No, no, you, so you don't have any problem with it in principle. It's only in practice that you No, no. <laughs> I have the, very, the, the, the difference between us is altogether different. The difference between us is I think that you are more likely to achieve that, far more likely to achieve that, with a minimal state and a minimal government than you are with a big government. That the private economy, that, that the market should not be interpreted so narrowly. It includes charitable activity. It, it was an expression of market activity when Carnegie established private libraries all over the country. It was a market, mark of private activity when, and a market activity when these nonprofit hospitals were established. What, I'm, what my argument is that a more effective means of achieving our common objectives, our objectives are the same. Uh, I agree with you. Where people end up is tremendously amount of luck. I hope you've enjoyed Free to Choose and that you'll continue to think about the ideas we've discussed and the way they affect your lives. Mm -hmm.